Walk into any public school today and things look very familiar. Buses pulling up to the front door, kids talking and laughing, teachers and principals walking the hallways. You see posters on the walls and books on the shelves. It's a reassuring picture on the surface, but that picture of public education in Michigan is showing some serious cracks. Just like any Michigan household or business, costs are rising every day for our public schools. In tough financial times, schools have only two options, increase the money coming in or cut costs. Public schools don't control how much money they receive, and educators say they're reaching the limits of how many more cuts our schools can absorb before the programs that impact children are seriously affected. This next school year, in the, in the fall of 05, I, I think parents and the community for the first time in, in this three-year problem are really going to notice that there are changes in their schools, and I don't think they're going to like it. We've prepared this video to help state taxpayers have a better understanding of how our schools are financed today. This video also looks at the looming problems caused by the current system, and it offers some ideas about how all of us can work together to solve these problems. You can see plenty of good things in our public schools today. Statewide over the past three years, student scores on state assessment tests are going up for all students, male and female, rich and poor, urban and rural. Graduation rates are rising statewide. More Michigan students are enrolling in college and advanced training programs than ever before. Students from elementary to high school are working every day with computers, mirroring how technology is used in business and industry. Distance learning programs bring the world into our classrooms, allowing students to interact in real time with experts in specialized fields. School districts are more efficient today through the cooperative efforts of better trained teachers, administrators, and school board members. Intermediate school districts and regional educational service agencies are helping schools save money by coordinating purchases and providing business and technical services. No one disputes the benefits high quality schools bring to a community. They keep property values high. They boost the local economy and add immeasurably to the cultural and social fabric of a community. If we're going to have a state that's going to be attractive to business and industry to come here and to young people to, to either stay here if they are here or move here in, in the future, I think uh, uh, most people make a decision on where they're going to live based upon the quality of education, uh, first at the K-12 level, and that's our obligation. Make no mistake, schools cost money. From the time Michigan attained statehood in 1837 until 1994, the basis for school funding was property taxes. Residents paid for their local schools through these property taxes, and for generations, the system was adequate. This system, however, led to wide disparities in funding from one district to another. Taxpayers, many of whom didn't have children in local schools, were feeling overburdened by their ever-rising property taxes. By the early 1990s, taxpayers demanded a change in the system. We had a property tax uh, a revolution in this state. I mean, there was a taxpayers association in every county. And people were just screaming about uh, that older people had, were losing their homes. You couldn't afford to buy a home. Uh, the millage in a lot of communities was over 40 for just for uh, schools. We had a state aid formula that was based on the number of mills you passed. A tremendous inequity across the state. So that was the key, uh, was to move, uh, get off the property tax. With the backing of the state legislature and governor, voters in 1994 approved a plan called Proposal A to shift the major burden of financing schools away from the local property taxes and onto the state sales tax and other taxes. The legislature also promised that Michigan's public schools would be a top priority of the state and that the state, not the local taxpayers, would be responsible for providing local schools with the money they needed to give all Michigan students the highest quality education. The state's strong economy through the rest of the 1990s compensated for most of Proposal A's limitations. However, that changed when the economy slowed as we entered the 21st century. In 2002, the state set the minimum school aid allocation per student at $6,700. Over the past two years, Michigan's overall budget problems have led the state to actually allocate less money per student. Despite its promise to keep the minimum school aid allocation per student at $6,700, the state has significantly reduced the amount of money for many areas, such as specialized programs in math and science and for gifted and talented students. Educators say the recently proposed 2.6% increase in state school spending isn't enough to match the expected increases in basic costs, 
and doesn't address shortfalls in school aid carried over from the two previous years. Well, this is the biggest challenge that school administrators have had probably in 20 years. I was a superintendent in the 80s and 90s, and you'd have executive order cuts and some of those things. Um, we were relatively immune after Proposal A till recently, and a lot of that's because it's, Proposal A is not all bad. It's just not funded to the degree it needs to be funded. Um, at the same time that there weren't other changes to Proposal A, as you probably know, there were a lot of changes in the tax structure. And, uh, for example, the, uh, the income tax was reduced a half a point. And those things have added to problems for school administrators because in your community, a lot of people are trying to figure out why are you making cuts? You know, wh why, why can't our programs exist the way they did in the past? In the 2004-2005 school year, over $12.5 billion was allocated to Michigan's K-12 public school students. That's a huge number, but it's divided among Michigan's 1.7 million students, each of whom receives the state required 1,098 hours of instruction every year. It comes down to this. To educate our children, the state spends $6.58 an hour per child. The biggest source of revenue for the state school aid fund is the state sales tax. It accounts for about 44% of that fund. The rest is from such things as taxes on income, property, real estate transfers, cigarettes, liquor, and gambling. Because the lottery and casinos are publicized so widely, it's easy for people to lose sight of the fact that only 6% of the state school aid fund comes from the state lottery and casinos. The difference between what the school aid fund provides and what schools have been promised has been called the funding gap. Michigan's economic troubles and its current tax structure mean that unless the system changes, the amount of money available for schools will continue to shrink. There is a structural tax deficit. I mean, we can't ignore it anymore. Um, there were too many cuts made during that first 10 years of Proposal A. A lot of them need to be restored. Uh, we need to do it in a way that we're not greedy, though, and that we're sensitive to other areas that are being cut until the economy comes back. In a 2003 survey of school districts, virtually all districts were taking some significant cost-saving steps, including laying off employees, increasing the size of classes, not filling some positions, cutting programs or services, and holding off on repairs. The same kinds of cuts are anticipated every year that the state school funding gap is not met. It's not a question here of whether well, you're going to reduce. It's a question of can you meet the need for Michigan's economy. I mean, Michigan needs a a highly trained workforce to shift from a manufacturing economy, which is gone, to the high tech and the, uh, the, the new jobs. So what are the alternatives? Some suggest an increase in the statewide property tax earmarked for schools. Others say Michigan's tax structure as a whole needs revisions. For example, in 1994, when Proposal A was adopted, no one in the legislature foresaw the impact Internet sales would have. Today, the state loses an estimated $300 million in sales tax revenue every year from uncollected taxes on Internet sales. The sad part is that we've been dealing with short-term uh, uh, Band-Aid solutions over the years, and uh, we're, not, we're not going to uh, grow ourselves out of this, and we can't cut ourselves out of it. And I think that the short-term solution is to continue to, to try to do that to the best of our ability, but in my opinion, we absolutely must be looking at the, at the tax structure of the state. We need to set, I mean, even beyond education, we need to be talking about uh, what c kinds of public services do the people want and desire, both at the local government level and at the school level. And then we've got to look at the tax structure and say, will this sustain it? Finding the right option or combination of options to realistically address Michigan's school financing problem is no simple task. It requires the efforts of all of us to reach agreement and move ahead for our children's future. If we're going to succeed as a state, we have to find a way to continue to have quality schools. And I think during the late 80s and the 90s, we built up a system that is high quality. And I'd hate to see us lose it in the first decade of the new century. The experts agree there are structural problems in the way schools are funded. Citizens like you play a vital role in determining what our schools will look like in the future. If public schools are important to you, talk to your local school board members and your state legislators. The bottom line is, we all need to get involved.